There is rest for the wicked by Vincent Dure. Why do we choose this hotel? I thought you'd like it. I do. Okay, then. Ernest sat quietly on the bed without making a noise, one hand on top of the other, fully covering his knees. He was a glider, one of those men that creep on you. Rudolph did not sit next to him. He decided to explore the room. The white towels were to be put on the floor if dirty. The small soaps were wrapped. Housekeeping had just dropped off their bags. Two vintage suitcases that had a floral pattern for his husband and birds for him. They fit right in with the wallpaper, dark green and lush. Should we go to dinner? Sure. Is it time yet? It's seven. Then we should. Do you want to change? Yes. They looked alike. They talked at the same pace. They would initiate holding hands at the same time. Their droopy eyelids covered their gray eyes in the same way. Rudolph put on a dark green shirt and Ernest a dark blue one. They kicked off their leather derbies for some suede shoes with some navy blue socks. Rudolph tried to adjust Ernest's tie, but he mumbled something, went to the bathroom, and came back with an adjusted knot. Rudolph had left his own tie a bit crooked, but as he turned, Ernest had vanished, and he could hear the clicking sounds of his shoes in the long corridor. He caught up with him. There was panic in Ernest's eyes. There was absence in Rudolph's. Do you think it will be good? We'll know when we're there. You're right. You look nice. You too. Your hair is a bit long. Ernest's hair had outgrown Rudolph's this last week. I'll get it cut when we come back. I know. The elevator was old, and they did not smile at the operator. Ernest found him handsome. So did Rudolph. They both stared at him before deciding to stare at each other. They did so for a while, bored with the sight of a mirror, and both turned towards the faded golden gate that protected them from the passing walls. The grand dining room was subpar. It was cleaned thoroughly rather than perfectly. Ernest ran his finger on the carpet, which embarrassed Rudolph, and retrieved a bit of dust. It was Rudolph that clicked his tongue at this sight, and Ernest got up. They were irritated to not be assigned a table. They didn't like choosing one. Some people were laughing. They didn't seem to want to respect the drooping trees outside. A maid that was veiled like the rest of them brought them the first dish. Could you cut more silently? Yes. When are you going to start? Now. Some fish was served. When's your next photo shoot? In two days. One of them put down his cutlery silently. He shivered and cried a bit. Some guests stared at him. The maid that was putting down a parfait looked at him quizzingly. He's fine. She left and he regained composure. He had dabbed his eyes with his taupe napkin so efficiently and so early in the crying process that he had barely no traces of it. If anything, it had given his lashes a slightly thicker texture that matched exactly his husband's. When's the book launch? Next week. This time it was the other that shivered and cried and dabbed his eyes, except that he had bitten his lip, making his lips a bit redder, just like the lips in front of his. His humiliation had also led him to turning whiter, and the subtle complexion he caught that did not vary that much from his natural one brought him once again one shade closer to the man in front of him. Why did you write a tell-all? Why are you still a model? Ernest didn't touch his parfait, so neither did Rudolph. He didn't want to weigh more than his partner. Why did you do it? I don't know. They both got up and got back to the room. There was a storm and great flashes of lightning provided enough light for the both of them. They kicked off their shoes before putting them neatly on each side of the bed, and then they lied down on it. They adjusted themselves so they'd be symmetrical, on the side, knees slightly bent, facing each other, with a hand on each other's hip and the other underneath their own head. They were still fully clothed, but both felt the need to cover up. The wallpaper turned a bit darker, as did the suitcases. The whimsical birds and quirky flowers now looked aged and eerie, as did the men's skin. The light had accentuated the cavities of their faces, and they looked hollowed out, like wax that had burned for too long. But that was only for a second. The rest was invisible. It wasn't darkness, it was just layered with some slices of it. You could still see the gossamer curtain. It reminded them of their wedding, of how they had liked the curtains. They wanted less lace, less show. They considered a gay wedding show enough, but the curtains were there in the pictures. There was lace everywhere in the hotel. In fact, Rudolph felt like gossamer dipped in wax, like smothered transparency. He got up and sat on the side of the bed. Ernest sat down next to him this time. I don't think I need that nose job. Why? It wouldn't look like yours anymore. Would that hurt your career? Yes. There was a small lull where one of the four hands crept on the other before he continued, Anything for you.
Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. Today's episode, If I Knew Then, is actually inspired by the last line of Vincent Duray's biography. When contributors are selected to have their work appear on the show, I ask them to send about a five sentence biography that we put on the website and send around social media. And I have to quote you the last line of Vincent's because it's hilarious. He says, in his spare time, he enjoys imagining all the ways a future marriage could go wrong and writing stories about them, which I just thought was great. And so today's episode is all about the situation you get into in love and in life. And you think, if I had known how this was going to end when I first had the brilliant idea to date this person or make these decisions, I would have made a very, very different decision. I'm not going to talk a whole lot today about these stories, just get you straight to them. There are three today, so you just heard there is Rest for the Wicked. Up next is Brian Burmeister's Bleeding Out, and then at the end you'll hear Jason Krasinski's Smooth Operator. This episode is not explicit in any way, but I will, in my NPR fashion, tell you, if you are squeamish about the sight or the visualization of blood, the next two stories may not be for you. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you for episode 16 on No Extra Words. Enjoy the day. Bleeding Out by Brian Burmeister. About a year after Elizabeth's book was released, Doug invited me to his parents' farm. I hadn't been there since we were kids. We stayed the night and spent much of the morning around the breakfast table. As we were finishing up, Doug's mother mentioned to me that she'd read Elizabeth's book. When she asked what I thought of it, my answer was silently passed from eye to eye, all around the table. Before we left, Doug wanted to walk the perimeter of the farm. Eventually, he stopped us in front of the chicken pen. Didn't say a word. I waited and waited, but got nothing from him. I began to walk back to the house. He said, Imagine you're a chicken. I stopped. Now what did she do? He continued. She cut off your head, right? Unexpected and swift. And you're running all over the place like an idiot because you don't have a brain anymore, which I get. But the thing of it is, and I want you to listen, the blood keeps gushing out, shooting high into the air. And you're running all over the place while the blood keeps pumping. It makes a mess of everything, everywhere. But I get what you're doing, because your head's long gone. He lifted the pen's latch and stepped inside the fence. He knelt down next to some of the chickens, then put his hand in his pocket, rummaged around. I feared he was going to pull out a knife and slit some poor chicken's throat. But he brought out some seed. There's a good to this, he said. With each stupid little move you make, more blood comes out. You see? You with me? Eventually everything is going to be pumped out. You make a mess, then it's done. You fall down and stop. I don't know why, but I grew suddenly amused. A group of chickens fought savagely over the feed he tossed on the ground. He looked at me for the first time since he began. His eyes, hard, stabbed me for something, anything. So I asked him, shouldn't the blood have run out by now? Although I was damn near laughing when I asked it. I didn't care for his look. It should have, he said, stern. Yes. Smooth Operator by Jason Kurzinski. It was finished. The Grigri love suit was ready. 360 red Grigri bags were stitched together to make one of the finest pieces in men's fashion. Yo, man, what are you wearing? Did you stitch some Grigri bags together? You know those things are supposed to be hidden. Alex proudly stepped through his neighborhood with his red Grigri outfit. His chest puffed out. He felt like he was levitating. He strutted down the street. His gait was as smooth as Isaac Hayes. He was ultra-confident. You smell like you bathe in a vat of cayenne pepper. You reek something fierce. Groups of onlookers hollered from across the street. He continued to strut, making eye contact with everyone he passed, ignoring the hecklers. He was too consumed by glory to notice the trail of women in hot pursuit. Hordes of women trailed behind his heels. Not out of love, but rather they were consumed by an intense hunger. He smelled like a crawfish boil. The Grigri bags had been overloaded with cayenne pepper because he chose an untrained voodoo priestess who lived only a few doors down from him. The smell of cayenne wafted through the streets. Alex turned around to see a hundred women in tow. 
He waved at all the women following him, not aware that they were only waiting for the right time to pounce. His stride became more buoyant. He was on cloud nine. The Grieger suit he had worked on was paying off. He had a hundred women to choose from to become his lover. Yo, man, one of his friends called out. Yo, those women are drooling at the mouth. I told you to see the voodoo priestess on Rampart, not the so-called priestess living down the block. Her Grigory bags have never given results. He shunned his friend. You smell like a thousand crawfish that have just been boiled. You better run as fast as you can. Alex looked behind him once more. Drool poured from their mouths. He sprinted as fast as he could, which was no faster than a turtle. The weight of the suit wouldn't allow him to move quickly enough to break free of the women that were following him. Thirty seconds into his sprint, he tripped on a sidewalk pothole, causing him to lose his balance. He struggled to right himself. The weight of the bags were too much to overcome. They enveloped him, snacking on the oversized crawfish they thought he was. A tasty crawfish he was indeed. The women walked away. Bloodstains were caked on the sidewalk. Not a morsel was left. The day was a Tuesday, the 23rd of March. If you walk near the corner of Conti and Basin, you can still smell traces of cayenne pepper. As for the voodoo priestess who used too much cayenne pepper, she decided to switch careers. She is now tending bar at a dive in the French Quarter, telling the tale of Alex, the man who smelled like a vat of boiling crawfish.